15 years, and the Wersies have been fulfilled. The United States and the world are locked deep in environmental crisis. The atmosphere, the earth, and the seas are perilously polluted. For the first time in human history, the total extinction of man is possible, even likely. It didn't happen all at once. The years whirl away and men fail to act. And when it was too late, the disasters began. What follows is a fictionalized new special program in the year 1985. Television and radio communications are still intact. The president has just spoken to the nation. Our dramatized news program begins immediately after he is finished. The things we will describe have not actually happened, but they could. The president has just asked for the complete support of the American people in this time of crisis. Now, by his order, all radio and television networks will stay on the air 24 hours a day to relay official instructions and developments, as we have since the beginning of the Los Angeles smog disaster two days ago. Now, to summarize the president's speech, undoubtedly the grimmest in American history. We are in the middle of a national catastrophe. For a quarter century, the president said, we have talked about pollution and population and the dying environment. We talked, but we didn't do nearly enough. And now it's as if nature and the ghost of neglect have conspired to take their revenge all at once. Now, as the president phrased it, the most immediate danger to life is the air around us. It has become increasingly toxic in recent months and has already killed thousands of Americans and sickened millions of others. In Los Angeles, the death toll is mounting rapidly. The smog that crept in more than 48 hours ago still hangs over the Los Angeles basin, and the total number of victims is soaring. At last count, more than 11,000 people had died because of the toxic fumes of the two-day temperature inversion. And many times that number are crowded into every hospital and medical facility in the area. Los Angeles is nature's perfect trap for smog, and that smog, in turn, has now trapped more than three million human beings. No one knows how many people are dead in their homes in the populous San Fernando Valley. Many citizens panicked by the death around them, crammed into their cars and rushed onto the freeways to flee the city. The highways are now jammed and the people in the basin cannot escape. There is no place for them to go and not enough time. City, state, and military officials are struggling to restore order in Los Angeles, but many privately admit the battle may already be lost. But no matter what they try, it will be far too little and much too late. This is George Putnam in Los Angeles. As the president indicated earlier, more than 130 cities report toxic smog conditions, but nowhere else are they anything like those we just heard George Putnam describe in Los Angeles. Now, the major source of air pollution in that city is, of course, the automobile, as it is in most major American cities. Industries also contribute a large share, and up until recent weeks, the smokestacks were polluting full blast. Absentee rates in the American workforce have risen sharply in recent days during this period of particularly heavy air pollution. Production is slowly coming to a halt, and soon skies distorted with columns of smoke may become only a murky memory. As people and their cars stay home, as industries curtail output, some smog may clear up. And so there's a good chance that the wave of air pollution, deaths, and illnesses that inundated the country may be receding. Meanwhile, millions of people who show no signs of physical illness are suffering a strange lassitude. Public health officials tell us that this, too, is caused by the bad air surrounding us. But whatever the cause, death, illness, or lassitude, vital services in many cities are seriously crippled or non-existent, among them police, fire, and garbage collection. Now, the National Guard units, even though they, too, are understaffed, are replacing policemen and firemen in some areas. But the garbage crisis 
may continue for some time. There simply aren't enough people to do the work. 47 cities now have some two weeks of uncollected garbage on the streets, and the threat of a major epidemic is growing. Now, generally speaking, water plants in America are automated and require small staffs, and so most of them are still in operation. With the exception of Chicago, there is no city in the nation without water tonight, although quality in many areas is falling off rapidly. Most American cities, except those in the Northeast, have electricity. Now again, nature has conspired to bring us down. The current East Coast heat wave coaxed millions of air conditioners into action and triggered the blackout now affecting the area from Boston to New York. But despite the blackout, we are still in direct communications with New York. Some lights burn in this city tonight, but they're few. They stand out like lighthouse beacons beckoning the stranded and the confused traveler to safety and security. Only vital services remain in operation. Auxiliary power units sustain hospitals, police, and fire stations are minimally lit. In the early darkness of this giant city, National Guardsmen called up three days ago and the governor declared martial law, patrol the streets guarding against looting. Small bands of hungry scavengers have been ransacking isolated stores and homes off and on for about a week now. In more secure sections, the mayor has ordered food stores and warehouses to remain open, for the stocks are nearly depleted. And with transportation services almost inoperative, little food is coming into this city. So far, there have been no cases of starvation deaths reported, but many people are definitely hungry. With most businesses shut down, many streets are deserted except for the occasional patrols. Hundreds of thousands of people who were trapped in Manhattan when essential transportation first collapsed, have since found other ways to leave the city. Many suburbanites who work in New York finally walked the 20 or 30 or more miles home. And hotels which were jammed two days ago are now empty, except for those travelers from distant cities stranded here when the airports closed down. Meanwhile, with practically no automobile traffic and factories in the area closed down, the air over this city is clearer tonight than it has been for more than a decade. And with no smog tonight, no lights on, one can actually see the stars twinkling. A rare sight for New Yorkers. This is Bill Jorgensen in New York. I'm just getting some late word regarding the president. He has decided to remain here in Washington during the current crisis, despite requests from Congress that he and his family be evacuated for reasons of safety. Now, this city, of course, also has its share of smog, and it's a clear threat to health, but the president insists he will stay here at the seat of government. A joint session of the Congress yesterday gave him what amounts to a blank check for handling the crisis, and he now has the most extraordinary powers any American leader has ever wielded. Among the first things the president has ordered, as he explained tonight, is the immediate rationing of food supplies. They are dangerously low, dwindling fast, and some may be contaminated. Now, obviously, with the present worldwide food crisis, we are unable to import foodstuffs, and to compound the situation, our domestic output is down this year. The great western drought of last spring and the increasing toxicity of irrigation waters combined to cut food production through much of the country last fall to less than half the usual output. And we continue this year to be hurt most in those areas where we once placed our heaviest reliance. Glenn Hansen reports. This is America's great breadbasket, the Midwest. But we're alarmed out here, alarmed at the rate our farms and croplands are being abandoned. No one living in this fertile plain and watching these lands endlessly produce their bounty ever believed it could happen. It's as simple as that. For a hundred years, the great expanse of land from the Mississippi to the Rockies, from Texas to Montana, poured forth a superabundance of wheat, corn, and cattle to feed a nation in the world. It was an article of faith here that anything that increased the yield was good. And that wasn't the purely selfish point of view. After all, we had people to feed, and we took our responsibilities seriously. The surprising thing now is how long it took us to see what was happening. Oh, we see it now, of course. The poisons we spread everywhere killed the insects just as they were supposed to do. But then they killed the fish, and they killed the wildlife, and then they killed the land.
Pick up a handful of dirt anywhere, from Ohio to Colorado, and you'll find it full of pesticides. Scoop up a cup full of water from any lake, river, or stream from the Alleghenies to the Rockies, and you'll find these same poisons. They won't last forever, of course. The chemicals in the soil and the water will break down, disappear, and then the land will live again. It will happen in a few decades, three or four or even five. But in the meantime, what do we eat? This is Glenn Hansen in what was once the great food producer, the Midwest. And so along with everything else, we suffer the curse of the pesticides. We didn't embrace that evil innocently. As early as 20 years ago, we were told of the dangers in pesticides. And yet even with those warnings, we seemed unable to escape our fate. Metro Media Science editor Ken Gilmore explains. Even back in the mid-1960s, they called them the Dirty Seven, the chlorinated hydrocarbons of which DDT was the best known. At one time, they had been of tremendous benefit to mankind. In India alone, malaria was killing three quarters of a million people a year. After DDT, the death toll dropped to 1,500 for a while. And the powerful new pesticide saved millions of dollars worth of crops crucial in a food-hungry world. Then problems began to develop. The trouble was that the chlorinated hydrocarbons were persistent. They didn't break down quickly into harmless chemicals. Years after they were sprinkled or dusted or sprayed into the atmosphere, they were still active and deadly. Runoff water washed them off the land and into the rivers and streams, and eventually into the oceans, where year after year, they continued to accumulate. In the water, a curious process called biological magnification took place. The pesticides were absorbed in small quantities by algae, single-celled plants. Bacteria and minute aquatic animals ate the algae and their DDT. Small fish ate the minute animals, and larger fish ate them. And they were eaten in turn by still larger fish. As early as 1969, the FDA seized tons of coho salmon because their DDT content made them unfit for food. But the birds didn't know that. The bald eagle and the brown pelican, the osprey in Rhode Island, and the herring gull on Lake Michigan ate fish and were wiped out. The poisons spread over the globe. Penguins in the Antarctic were found to have DDT in their tissues, too. By 1969, a Swedish toxicologist had examined hundreds of nursing mothers and found that the DDT content of their milk was more than twice the amount allowed in cow's milk. Three states outlawed the chemical, and the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare announced that DDT would be banned in the entire country except for essential uses. That was the out the DDT forces needed. Manufacturers took a lesson from the cigarette battle a decade earlier. They continued to claim in the face of rising evidence that there was no proof that DDT was doing anybody any harm. And they and the agricultural interests continued to find more and more essential uses. But in the long run, it didn't do any good. More and more strains of insects became resistant to one insecticide after another, and the poisons killed natural predators. Soon, resistant strains of insects were destroying the food crops even more hungrily than they had been before. But by that time, the land was poisoned, and the sea, and the whole earth. And in yet another way, man's contempt for his environment had led to the ultimate payoff. This is Ken Gilmore reporting. Concentration in the news business in recent weeks has quite naturally been here at home, here in America. But if we have finally learned one thing from the science of ecology, it is that all things are interrelated and our current agonies are not unconnected to those being endured by other men elsewhere around the world. Other nations are suffering catastrophes, some much worse than our own. From our own Metro Media Newsroom here in Washington is Alan Smith. Latest reports from our overseas news bureaus indicate smog-like conditions have developed over London, Paris, and Rome. Thousands of people terrified by the accounts of the Los Angeles disaster have begun to evacuate those cities. So far, no casualties have occurred.
On the other side of the world, food riots are still ripping through the major cities of India and China and Japan. The total number of dead in most recent cycle of starvation and social unrest is unknown. However, estimates based on similar conditions in those three countries over the past five years indicate the figure will be astronomical. All communications with the capital cities of New Delhi, Peking, and Tokyo ceased more than a week ago. But preliminary reports then have put riot and starvation deaths into the tens of millions. Starvation deaths also are occurring with increasing frequency on the continent of Africa. The United Nations says at least 10 governments there have collapsed in the turmoil of mass starvation and social upheaval. As is often the case, the innocent are suffering the most. The children of Africa are in no way responsible for the current conditions. Yet they are suffering and dying like insects. The populations of the underdeveloped countries of Africa exploded during the 70s and 80s. In fact, despite an appalling death rate, the number of children there actually increased. Now, war, famine, pestilence, and social unrest are taking their toll. And if the population here is eventually stabilized, it will be because of the massive deaths of these children. In the last two decades, most of the children born in Africa, Asia, and South America entered the world already under a death sentence in their earliest years. What conditions prevail tonight in South America, there is no way of knowing. No one has been in any extended contact with any of the capital cities there in more than four days. Finally, the latest figures from Mexico City indicate 9,000 have died there in the past two days. That city is struggling out of a dysentery epidemic similar to the one in Cairo, Egypt, three years ago. Mark? Thank you, Alan. The disasters we're enduring these days are clearly connected to the massive population explosion throughout the world in this century. In New York, Bill Jorgensen has some observations. The population of the United States in 1984 reached 280 million, and it's still soaring. In the rest of the world, the birth rate is more obviously out of control. Every time your heart beats, five more hearts begin to beat for the first time somewhere on this crowded globe. Fifteen years from now, in the year 2000, the beat of new hearts will be a crashing crescendo, drowning out all reason and washing entire civilizations into oblivion. Each squall of new life carries us further down the road. To what? First, a loss of privacy and dignity, and then a loss of spirit, now an increase in violence and pain. But worse yet, much worse, dawn to dusk hunger will be at the center of most lives from birth until death. And the unspeakable, cannibalism, will be the language of whole communities. In the year 2000, between seven and eight billion bodies will battle for life trapped in a tiny world that could not sustain three billion people only 20 years ago. In 15 years, people will die like colonies of insects. Each new increment of life brings that death for the rest of us a little closer and sooner. A scant quarter of a century ago, a birth was an occasion for celebration, for joy and awe, and now it's cause for sorrow and fear. Beyond the wars, the famines and the pestilences, what fearful rites and ceremonies, what politics, what strange gods will tomorrow reveal? As H asked when he foresaw the wreckage of the 20th century, what it would bring, what rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born? This is Bill Jorgensen in New York. Now that report from New York, of course, contains some of Bill's own views, and to be fair, not all experts agree with his analysis of the crisis. They insist the world can sustain its current population and perhaps even accommodate more, but generally do agree some rather drastic measures are needed to control the birth rate. Now the president talked about overpopulation in our own country at some length tonight during his address. He promised that within the next few days, he will outline a major new program to deal with the problem. Metro Media White House correspondent Maury Povich is just back from a conference with presidential advisors, and he examines some of the forms the new program may take. The crux of our problem seems to be that most of the solutions offered a quarter of a century ago to stem the flood of births simply have not been effective enough. Since 1976, 90% of our states have had laws so liberal as to make abortion at any time the complete right of a pregnant female, her right alone. 
contraceptive devices, agents, and instructions in their use have been a function of the federal government since late 1977. But these approaches were too little, too late. The birth rate continued, unabated, although some slight dips misled a few demographers into believing the decline had begun. It hadn't, of course, and in 1980, Congress enacted and the President signed legislation eliminating the anachronistic income tax exemption for each offspring. That had some impact, but by then our population had grown so large that any increase in the birth rate was unacceptable. It seems likely that the President will offer this next session of Congress legislation to assess special and heavy taxes on the first child, double that amount on the second child, and absolutely forbid a third child pregnancy, which will have to be aborted by law. Thus, the specter of the civil libertarians will have come into being. The government will indeed invade the bedroom, even the body, for the simple sake of survival. It will have no other choice. Government-ordered sterilization is likely to come up this session. Also, Congress will want to authorize studies on the feasibility of putting contraceptive agents in our drinking water. The president will ask for, and Congress will probably grant, large expenditures for massive re-education programs. All experts agree that the contemporary attitudes toward childbearing are at the center of resistance to change. The education money will be spent convincing Americans that reproduction is not essential to the good life and that the measure of a man or woman is not connected with his or her ability to produce children. Some of these approaches clearly run counter to the traditional notions of Western democracy, but it is us, after all, we the inheritors of those traditions, who have bred ourselves into ecological disaster. For the simple truth is, either the birth rate must come down or the death rate will surely go up, as present trends indicate. Now in his address tonight, the president ordered all citizens, particularly those in urban areas, not to throw out household refuse until the current collection crisis has passed. Well, as your nose and eyes tell many of you, public and private garbage collection services in many major cities have broken down. Alan Smith spent part of today here in Washington with public health officials concerned with the mounting garbage piles in our cities. Alan? Well, Mark, the latest figures indicate that 47 cities, all of them with populations of more than 100,000, are suffering acute discomfort, if not danger, because of the garbage collection crisis. In some cities, many in the northeast section of the nation, the piles of garbage are so high you can't see from one side of the street to the other. The rat population is exploding, and the mounting threat to public health, of course, is obvious. Major epidemics cannot be avoided much longer, particularly in this heat. Officials are publicly optimistic that as soon as the smog and other crises have abated, massive collection campaigns can clean up our cities again inside of two months. I'm not so optimistic. As long as a year ago, there were signs the system was beginning to break down. And I, for one, believe we can never return to the old methods and not have crises like this develop again. The problem is more profound than collection. It's also more complex than simple disposal. We have enough space in the United States to bury our refuse efficiently if we're willing to spend the money to transport it around the country. But the real issue is waste. Just how long can we go on manufacturing things, using them once and then discarding them forever? How long can we pretend our resources are inexhaustible? Fifteen years ago, experts were decrying the consumer convenience syndrome that motivated American manufacturers and the public. Even then, they warned that contemporary disposal systems would have to be replaced with techniques for the recycling and reuse of garbage. No one paid much attention. Until recently, it's always been cheaper in this country, with our abundant resources, to make new items rather than recycle or rework the old ones. Well, now, of course, our streets and lots are buried in one-way, no-return bottles and aluminum cans and plastic products that won't decay. Then there are tons of paper and cardboard containers for which whole forests have perished. Here in the Middle 80s, we find each American using some 600 pounds of pulpwood products each year, much of it as packaging or decoration for the goods they cart home. In the rest of the world, people with simpler lives use only four or five pounds of pulp wood a year. And most of the stuff we cart home ends up in the garbage pile, never to be used again. The wholesale destruction of our once great forests to manufacture frivolous cardboard packages recalls that anguished cry from Thoreau. Thank God they can't cut down the clouds. <laughs>
But looking at our skies these days, I'm not so sure. It's not just household garbage that's burying us. The American countryside from coast to coast is scarred with junk cars. Recent estimates indicate more than 80 million abandoned cars rot beside our superhighways and pile up on vacant lots. And so here we sit in the last quarter of the 20th century, staring vacantly at empty horizons, crowded and poisoned by our own refuse and rustling toward death through stacks of old newspapers and rusting automobiles. Mark? The governor of Illinois declared martial law today in and around Chicago. That city is suffering a major water shortage crisis. Riots and lootings have broken out, and there have been some casualties. Joyce Velasco reports. We're obviously having a little trouble with that report. We'll get back to Joyce Velasco in just a few moments. Now, Chicago's main water source is Lake Michigan, and it is, of course, heavily polluted. But as we found out during the congressional hearings in 1982, most American water sources are heavily polluted. 99% of the oxygen in our 22 major river basins is exhausted. The Potomac, the Hudson, and the Missouri are typical of the current conditions of our rivers. At first, the worst thing we thought about it was the smell. Phosphorus from human waste and from detergents poured into the Potomac at the rate of about 10,000 tons a day from the sewers of Washington alone. The phosphorus nourished billions of tiny green algae. And as they multiplied, long strings of them clung together in gelatinous masses. And soon, in some spots, the entire river was covered with a foot-thick sludge. And then the algae died, and uncounted tons of bacteria feasted on the rotting vegetation. The decaying algae oxidized, robbing the river of its oxygen. The dying bacteria decomposed, giving off the smell of an outhouse. Every year, the running river struggled to renew itself, washing out to sea much of the filth that we dumped into it. But it finally reached its limit, and it died. The smell is still there, but it's no longer our chief concern. For years, Washington and most of the metropolitan district got its water from the upper Potomac, high above the area that was polluted. But year by year, as the population grew, more towns used the convenient river. For the sewage, they couldn't process themselves. The runoff from more farmland laden with fertilizer and other chemical agents added to its burden. So today, our water supply stands in peril. And we here in Washington, in the nation's capital, stand indicted by a silent stream. Without oxygen, without beauty, and without a future. This is Mari Povich on the Potomac. The Dutch explorers 300 years ago were almost poetic about the broad Hudson River. They rhapsodized about the sweetness of the air, the purity of the water, the abundance of fish in the river, and game on the shores. But by the middle of this century, the once sparkling waterway was the dumping ground for more than 400 industrial polluters who poured an incredible brew of chemicals, dyes, acids, oil, silt, soap, and detergents into its overburdened waters. They were helped in their destruction by scores of towns and cities along the river banks who filled it with human excrement and the other affluent of urban life. By the early 1970s, New York Harbor was a cesspool the river for more than 100 miles north was fouled with rotting boats, old tires, raw sewage, and a thousand other putrid products. There were some efforts to clean up the Hudson, but as the population continued to grow, the government refused to spend money for efficient cleansing systems, and the sewage treatment plants of the 1970s were outdated before they were ever built. And too many attempts to stop individual polluters went through an endless series of arguments, hearings, and court battles, and then frequently failed to accomplish very much. So each year, the river where shad and sturgeon had once swum upstream to spawn became dirtier. And today, as the tides ebb and flow in the estuary of the Great River, the accumulated garbage and filth sloshes back and forth 
like an obscene rhythmic ballet. This is Bill Jorgensen along the Hudson River. The Eastern Rivers have been getting all the attention in recent years. They were turned into open sewers back in the 50s and 60s. But most people don't know that we've killed the great waterways of the West, too. Take the Missouri, for example. The first thing we did back in the 70s was to dam the Missouri and its tributaries to death. A free river once gushed out of its birthplace in the mountains of Montana and tumbled across the plains for more than 2,000 miles. Gradually, as navigation, flood control, and electric power needs grew, we threw more and more dams across the rivers of the Missouri Basin. A running river has some capability of cleansing and revitalizing itself, but we turned these waterways into a long series of lakes and ponds. Then, as the cities of the plains expanded, they dumped more and more of their sewage and phosphate-laden detergents into the once clear water. In the 70s, there were some efforts at reform. Attempts were made to force the cities and industries on the vast Missouri drainage basin to clean up their filth, but nobody wanted to be first. And the political power of the major polluters was immense. And so today, a string of stinking cesspools stretch out where once pure rivers flowed toward the sea. This is Glen Hansen on the banks of the Missouri River. The killing of the rivers was bad enough, but it was just the first step. As the chemicals, the insecticides and herbicides, the oils and acids, the detergents and the poisons flowed into the rivers, they eventually made their way to the sea. Back in the mid-60s, some experts estimated that as many as a half million different chemical substances, many of them highly toxic, were flowing into the oceans. Radioactive nuclear waste were dumped into the sea too. They were put in containers, but the containers couldn't last forever, and some of the wastes would retain their radioactivity for thousands of years. The combined effect of this hellish brew on the seas was beyond guessing. Some authorities pointed out that perhaps we should find out what the effect would be before we unloaded ever larger quantities of poisons into the ocean. But nobody much listened, and little was done. In the mid-70s, the collapse began. Fish that returned to the rivers to spawn simply died when they swam into the contaminated streams. Shellfish, the clams and oysters that live in the shallow tidal estuaries had long since been killed by the oil and other chemicals that have continued to foul the sea. By 1978, seabirds had almost disappeared. Some killed by specific accidents, but most simply victims of the rising level of DDT and other poisons in the fish they ate. The commercial fishing industry was only a memory by 1980, and that collapse, of course, marked the beginning of the still-spreading famine that struck Japan and China, both of which were so highly dependent on their harvest from the sea. But the worst was yet to come. It was back in the mid-1960s that an obscure professor in a Midwest college first recognized the possibility that faces us now. It had long been known that the greenery on land, the trees and grass and bushes, generate about 30% of the Earth's oxygen supply through the process of photosynthesis. The other 70% is made by the minute, single-celled plants of the sea, the phytoplankton. In the early 1970s, it was discovered that DDT and other powerful insecticides could slow down the process of photosynthesis in the sea, even when present in unbelievably minute amounts. In larger concentrations, of course, it simply killed. Still, few believed that the vastness of the sea could ever be really polluted. Today, we know better. Although we don't know how bad it is, we do know that vast areas of the oceans are now devoid of the plant life so necessary to the continued existence of life on Earth. The percentage of oxygen in the air has so far dropped only slightly. The hope is that the process of oxygen depletion, if that is what has now started, will take many years and will be reversible. But at least some calculations show that once the process begins, it may proceed at a faster and faster pace until soon, no more than a few years from now, the life-giving oxygen in the air we breathe will be gone. As of this moment, we simply don't know which course the world is taking. We can only wait and hope. This is Ken Gilmore reporting. Over the obvious pollutants in recent years, few Americans took 
we, we have some late developments now in the Los Angeles smog catastrophe. We switch to George Putnam. Despite an order banning all traffic except emergency vehicles on the Los Angeles freeways, the roads are now jammed beyond belief. And this city is beginning to experience what may be the most disastrous highway death toll ever. Fatalities are already into the hundreds and mounting. Military and civilian authorities are attempting to enforce the order that no cars can leave the area. They're instructing citizens to not even try. For still more car exhaust will only multiply the death rate. Actually, it is hopeless to attempt to leave the greater Los Angeles region. For there is nowhere in the area not affected by the smog. Latest police figures indicate that smog alone has now caused more than 14,000 deaths in Los Angeles. Traffic fatalities will certainly carry the total figure much higher. This is George Putnam in Los Angeles. Now let me reassure our viewers that the Los Angeles experiences George just described are unique tonight in America. The events he mentioned are occurring nowhere else. In fact, as we pointed out earlier, the complete halt in traffic in many cities may allow some toxic smog to clear up. So I repeat, there is considerable room for optimism there. Now, uh, as I was saying a moment ago, in all the clamor over the obvious pollutants in recent years, few Americans took note of a more insidious threat to life and sanity, noise. <laughs> Even back in the 60s and 70s, we knew that noise makes people deaf. Factory workers, big city taxi drivers, heavy machine operators often had hearing problems. Today, authorities estimate that 75 million of us have some kind of hearing impairment. The curious thing was that even back in the late 60s, with an estimated 15 million wholly or partially deafened, we didn't get alarmed enough to do anything about it. Even then, the sound level was unendurable. In 1969, Dr. David Lipscomb of the University of Tennessee measured the noise in a discotheque, then played it back at the same level for a cage full of guinea pigs. They lost their hearing, and he found that the delicate cells in their ears had been destroyed. By the early 1970s, we knew that prolonged exposure to loud noise causes the blood vessels to constrict, promotes hardening of the arteries, upsets digestion, produces involuntary responses in the nervous system, ruins sex life, and makes people jumpy, upset, and grouchy. But nevertheless, we went right on making noise. Through the 1970s, as the highways filled with more and more cars and the streets with noise of every kind, the skies continued to be ever noisier, too. We kept on building the SST, despite the fact that we knew it would be even noisier. We said we'd operated only over water, knowing all the time that the pressure to use it over land would become irresistible. Researcher Kenneth Henry of the University of Wisconsin was the first to prove that sound can kill. 
Back in 1970, he exposed mice to the loud clanging of a bell. That sensitized them. Priming, he called it. When a primed mouse was re-exposed to the bell, it died. It took just 15 seconds. The first human death from sound was on October 13, 1974. They thought at first it was a heart attack, but it wasn't. It was noise. There were a good many after that in places where the noise level was high. Today, it's quiet again. When the city and the factories shut down, so did the noise. But it looks like there should have been a better way to get some quiet. This is Ken Gilmore in New York. Like many of you, I can remember when it was possible to jump into the family car and ride for a long time without ever seeing another car or, or even another person. The United States looked like an impossibly large land a century or so ago. And if a man couldn't make it in the East, there was always the West. If not Boston, then Chicago or Denver or Salt Lake City or, or even as far away as Los Angeles. But we could and we did run out of land. There was an ocean on the other side of the Rockies and we found it and we stopped. Turned back and began to strip our rich earth of its life. We moved mountains, made roads, mined the minerals and cut down the great forests. And everywhere we went, we built cities and industries. We created marvels of technology and ingenious machines to take us on our mission. And then we abandoned them to rust. And now we are abandoned. We tamed nature, we thought. And now she is taming and shaming us. For we have learned there is an end to everything. Even that vast stretch of land and possibility called America. How did we get here? Why has it come to this? How did we cancel out the possibility that America offered a half a century ago and replace it with a future so dark that no one can tell what it may bring? Fifteen years ago, it seemed everyone in America was against pollution. One spring day back in 1970, the city of New York even closed some streets to the all-polluting automobile, and people celebrated Earth Day. Similar activities took place all over the country, and millions took part. There were politicians and prophets, speeches and promises, declarations and vows, petitions, exhibitions, signs and countersigns, and a great theme a firm life, save the earth. In those days, people sang a lot more than they do now. There were other campaigns back in those days. College students buried cars, Women's clubs packaged ecology kits, and hippies went back to the soil and lived in communes. Ambitious men jumped on the environmental bandwagon, promised heaven, and delivered hell on earth. There was a spate of newspaper and magazine articles and a flood of television programs on pollution and survival. But the sun still shone clearly in those days, and there was greenery in the parks, and the people went to enjoy the air. And for the young, again, there was music. 
people felt pretty good about things back then. They didn't know what the years would bring. There were wise men who predicted what would happen, and they tried mightily to do something, but there weren't enough of them. Most people assumed that since ecology had become a catchword in cocktail chatter, something was being done, and suddenly, it was too late. One looks back with sadness to those days, to the young people, the rock and the park, the brave little parades, and one wonders what would have happened if the people had fully realized what was already around them and what the future would bring. And so the best intentions on earth are not enough, not until enough people couple them with enough action. That's the lesson we've finally learned, too late. This is Bill Jorgensen in New York. Bill, uh, what you were just saying, uh, do you really think it's too late? I, I wonder if things are really as hopeless as you say. I'll admit what you, what you say is true, of course, but uh, I'm not at all certain that there aren't still some options open to us that there aren't some ways out. Can you see any room for optimism? Mark, I, I don't see the death of mankind overnight, but we are right now clearly on the edge of extinction, one way or another, if not by starvation, then by pestilence, and if not by those, then war, and most probably a combination of all three. I mean, Malthus was right all the time. There are simply too many people on this earth, and they've been consuming much too much. And I just can't sit here and play this happy little game that there's a ray of sunshine right over the horizon. We are in trouble, big, big trouble, and we are all going to be hurt. How seriously and for how long, I just don't know. Well, Bill, I, I understand that, of course. And I fully expect to suffer some. Uh, perhaps it's only right, uh, considering how we are at least partially responsible for the destiny we've created, but. I'm asking for a future for us after we've paid our debt. Well, we're big spenders, we Americans. And we've now spent most of our natural resources and squandered much of our environment. And now it's time to pay the bill. How much will it cost? The estimates run as high as an incredible trillion dollars to undo what we've so carelessly done. But that amount will buy a lot. And no matter what the cost, we're talking about buying the future. A future for our children, and for our children's children. Now, whether the federal government undertakes the job alone or in conjunction with industry, it is us. And we are all polluters. And we'll have to pay the bill. Well, George, money is one thing Americans have always had plenty of. I, I'm just not sure it's enough. Glenn Hansen in Kansas City, do you have anything to add? If we are to survive, I think a massive educational program is imperative. Every American must be taught what he personally has done to destroy the earth and what he can do to correct the errors of his ways. Then we all need to redirect our aims and establish some new priorities. Among them, perhaps we need to institute a no-growth national economy. Perhaps we need to legislate and enforce a zero-population growth plan, freezing all families at a maximum of two children. And then, and perhaps most importantly, we must prepare for a far simpler life. Oh, it would contain reasonable amounts of comfort and pleasure, but at its center would stand a rock of conviction. And that is that excessive consumption and the consequent rape of the Earth's resources is self-destruction, plain and simple. Uh, Maury Povich, uh, a little while ago, you were discussing government population control legislation. 
Do you see any hope there uh, to construct a reasonable future for us after these present crises have passed, of course? I don't know what else we can do, Mark. Most of the moral and certainly the legal objections to population control disappeared, oh, a decade ago. Still, our numbers increased by tens of millions. If we could stabilize or decrease our population here, it would help us, certainly, but it wouldn't change the world picture much. Most of the skyrocketing birth rates are occurring in the rest of the world, in the so-called underdeveloped countries. But what agonies the people in those countries must suffer and what pain they'll bring to us, well, it's almost too horrible to think about. Remember, the United States, with less than 6% of the world's population, consumes more than half the world's resources. In the United States, I think we should have legislation right now granting large bonuses to those families who have no children or just one. Ideally, I think we should come to some rational decisions as to what the population of the United States and even the world should be, and then cut the birth rate to eventually reach that ideal. Probably the best solution, if we had time, would be to change those attitudes time-honored and enshrined in our traditions all over the world that psychologically compel people to reproduce. Of course, Mari, as you well know, a change in attitude is always the hardest thing to accomplish, not only in population, but in all things. People construct myths and then persist in them, long after whatever utility they may once have had is gone. Look, for instance, at some of the myths that were current just 15 years ago when the population pollution crisis first began to attract attention. People insisted then, for example, that science would save us. The rationale was that science had made the problems, so science would naturally solve them. Now, of course, since the marriage of science and technology was a major part of the problem, there was no solution there, and 15 years later, here we still sit. Now, there was that silliest of all myths, the one about space travel saving us. Well, a knowledge of basic arithmetic could easily destroy that one. Or take the myth about the vast abundance of the sea. It was going to feed all those billions we had spawned at that time and the billions we've spawned since. Well, of course, what anyone who believed that one didn't know was that once we pollute the sky and the land, we also pollute the sea. So when we finally went to the vast cupboard in the oceans, it was bare. Mark? Thank you, Ken. Well, that's, that's been the experience of the last century, hasn't it? We simply used up too much carelessly and with no thought for the future. But, uh, you know, no one has answered my question, my original question yet. Do we have a chance to survive, and how? Glenn Hansen, out there in Kansas City, uh, what are your thoughts? The outlook for our survival right now is bleak. But I, for one, am optimistic that something can and will be done. The extent of the environmental crisis of recent months, and especially the president's speech today, have impelled many people to action. The governors of all the western states are meeting tomorrow in Denver, and this time it really sounds as though they're going to do something. And I've sensed a mood of determination in government and the public alike in recent weeks, and I'm certain we're finally going to do all those things that have to be done. And so I believe we'll be back on the air in the near future with the good news that millions of Americans have opted for a future for mankind. It's going to be a real battle, but I think we'll win simply because we can't afford to lose. Well, I, I fully agree with you, Glenn. Uh, despite these terrible calamities of recent weeks and months, uh, life still goes on, and I, I think if we apply ourselves, we can pull out of all this agony in a year or so. And from what we said before, I think George Putnam out there in Los Angeles agrees. Right, George? George? George Putnam. Well, obviously, we've temporarily lost Los Angeles. We'll get back to George just a bit later. Now, as we said earlier, this and all other television and radio networks will continue broadcasting throughout these current crises. Alan Smith, have you any further observations? Well, I was thinking about the need to rethink the role of government in its political and economic aspects. What I mean is, for instance, if we always thought about ecology first, and if our political, social, and economic systems flowed naturally from that basis, then How's that, Bill? Oh, no, just say it again. I, I just didn't hear you. Well, Mark, I, I was just commenting that what Alan is saying goes well beyond political and economic considerations.
and uh, gets into religion and philosophy. What we're really talking about here is some incredible transformation of the human spirit. And if men changed their notion of themselves as masters of the universe and decided to be a part of the whole, well, they would have different attitudes toward one another. Then we could move to... Well, we've obviously lost New York. We'll get back to Bill Jorgensen later on this evening. We also expect to be able to contact Chicago later on. These uh, temporary interruptions are to be expected considering the state of crisis that exists. Now, there are some hopeful developments tonight in the Pacific Northwest. And for that story... Thank <laughs> you. 